Howdy, y'all. I'm Mr. Fullerton, and today I want to talk about resistance, resistors, and resistivity. Our objectives, although these look pretty deep, are all pretty similar. Relate current and voltage for a resistor, write the relationship between electric field strength and current density in a conductor, describe how the resistance of a resistor depends upon its length, cross-sectional area, and we'll throw in resistivity, a material property, and finally, derive expressions that relate current, voltage, and resistance to the rate at which heat is produced when current passes through a resistor. So, let's start by talking about resistance. Resistance is the ratio of the potential drop across an object to the current flowing through the object. Objects that have a fixed resistance, when it's not a function of current or potential drop, are known as ohmic materials, and they're said to follow Ohm's law. Now, Ohm's law isn't really a theoretical law. It's more an empirical law that holds up and is extremely useful in the world of circuit analysis. If we make a graph of potential difference or voltage drop across an object compared to the current going through it, for an ohmic material, you have a straight line, and the slope of that line is going to give you the resistance. So R, the resistance, is equal to potential over current, and for ohmic materials, voltage drop then is IR, assuming R again is not a, that R is a constant. So that's Ohm's law and resistance. If we want to talk about the resistance of a wire, well that depends on the geometry of the wire, as well as a material property known as resistivity, which is given the Greek letter rho. That's usually measured in ohm meters. And that relates to the ability of the material to resist the flow of electrons. So if we take a look at something like a conductor or resistor here, it has some length L, some cross-sectional area A, then we could write then that its resistance R is equal to the resistivity of the material rho times the length divided by the area. Longer lengths, more resistance. Thinner conductors, resistors, more resistance. Smaller area. And of course, greater resistivity, greater resistance. You can almost think of it like water flowing through a pipe. Big diameter pipes, much lower resistance. Little skinny long pipes, very, very high resistance. Let's refine Ohm's law just a little bit further using what we know. If we start with potential drop equals current times resistance, well, we know that resistance is rho L divided by A. So I could write this as potential equals current times resistivity times length of our resistor divided by the area. But we also know that the electric field, when we're talking about a uniform object like this, is just going to be the potential drop divided by its length, E equals V over L. So I could then pull the L over to the left-hand side, divide both sides by L, and the left-hand side becomes E is equal to resistivity times current divided by area. But again, for a uniform object like this, our current density is going to be the electrical current divided by the area. So in this case, I can then write that the electric field is equal to the resistivity times our current density vector. So a way of relating all of these different items. E equals rho j. Let's also talk about the conversion of electrical energy to thermal energy. And as we do this, you have to realize that when we're using up energy in these circuits, that when we're a uh, resistor, for example, is using power, where's that going? Well, to other forms of energy, oftentimes heat. And we'll start by remembering that work done is charge times potential, or potential is the work done divided by the unit charge. And work, in this case, could be the energy that we're storing in something. So if we take the derivative of both sides with respect to time, the rate of change of the work we do is equal to the time derivative of charge times potential. But if you recall, power equals dW dt. So the left-hand side becomes power, then is equal to 
Well, our potential should be a constant, so that'll be v times dq dt. But if you recall, the rate of change, the rate at which charge passes an area, the rate of change of charge is going to be current flow, I equals dq dt. So we could rewrite this then as power is equal to current times voltage. Great, that's going to be very useful. But we also know if V equals IR, Ohm's law, we could write this as power equals I squared R. We could go another step further and replace I with V over R using Ohm's law again, another manipulation of the same formula to say that power is also V squared over R. So we have three different ways to determine the rate at which energy is used in these circuits, the power. And typically what we're doing in that case is converting electrical energy oftentimes into thermal energy. It can be other types of energy, but typically we start off with thermal as the most basic. Power equals I times V, power equals I squared R, and power equals V squared over R. Now what I want to do, instead of showing a bunch of different problems, let's take one involved problem and do it in a couple different ways, a couple different steps. So we're going to start off with the problem of a silver wire. It has a half millimeter radius cross section and it's connected to the terminals of a one volt battery. If the wire is 0.1 meter long, determine the resistance of the wire and the current flowing through the wire. We're given that the resistivity of silver is 1.59 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters. Its molar mass is 107.9 grams per mole, and its mass density is 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter. So let's start off by finding the resistance of the wire and the current. Well, to find resistance, R equals rho L divided by A. In this case, rho, since it's silver, our resistivity is 1.59 times 10 to the minus 8 ohm meters, its length is 0.1 meter, and its cross-sectional area, well that's going to be pi r squared, pi, and the radius is 0.5 millimeters or 0 0.0005 meters squared, pi r squared, run through this, meters squared in the denominator, meters times meters in the numerator, I'm going to be left with ohms, and running that through my calculator, that's about 0. 00202 ohms. Well, once we've got resistance, current should be pretty straightforward. We can use Ohm's law. I equals V over R. We have a one volt battery. R, we just found 0. 0.00202 ohms, gives me a pretty large current flow at about 494 amperes or 494 amps. All right, let's go back and see if we can't take this question a little bit further now. Same silver wire, same length, radius, resistivity, molar mass, mass density, but another question at the end. Determine the drift velocity of the free electrons in the wire and assume one free electron per atom in the wire, per silver atom. Well, I think the first thing we're gonna have to find is the charge carrier density. And we can find that charge carry carrier density is going to be Avogadro's number divided by our volume. And in order to find the volume, well, the density of silver is going to be the mass over volume. Notice this row here is the density, not the resistivity. Therefore, we can say volume is going to be the molar mass divided by its density. So then N our carrier density, volume carrier density, will be Avogadro's number times the density of silver divided by its molar mass. All right, now let's see if we can't find the drift velocity by starting with our equation for current. We already had current equals N, our volume carrier density, times the charge on each carrier, times our drift velocity, times the cross-sectional area. So rearranging for drift velocity, that's going to be I over NEA 
we just found n equal to that right there. So we could rewrite the drift velocity as I times the molar mass over Avogadro's number, density of silver, times Ea. All right, at this point, we can substitute in our values, which implies then that the drift velocity is going to be equal to, well, our current is 494 amps. Molar mass is 0.1079 kilograms per mole. Because we have 107.9 grams per mole, we'll convert it to SI units, kilograms, divided by Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, atoms per mole. We also have the density of silver, 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter, or 10,500 kilograms per cubic meter, times the charge on each charge carrier, an elementary charge, or 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, Finally, times the cross-sectional area. Pi times 0 0.0005 meters squared. Run all that through my calculator, and I come up with a drift velocity of right around 0 0.067 meters per second. Pretty small drift velocity compared to that thermal motion that we're used to. All right, let's go to step three here. Same wire, same constants, but now we want to determine the average time required for electrons to pass from the negative terminal of the battery to the positive terminal. The average time. Well, we can find that using basic kinematics. Our drift velocity is going to be the length divided by time. V equals D over T, or delta X over T. And if we want the time then, time is going to be the length that it travels divided by the average velocity. Our length is 10 centimeters, 0.1 meter. And our drift velocity we just found as 0 0.067 meters per second. So how long does it take on average for an electron to go from the negative terminal to the positive terminal? About 1.49 or 1.5 seconds. Hopefully that gets you a good start on resistors, resistance, and resistivity. If you need more help or looking for more information, check out aplusphysics.com. Thanks and make it a great day.